Welcome to Playing Above the Line, where we interview entrepreneurs, business owners, and community activists to get their thoughts and perspectives on leadership. Playing Above the Line is sponsored by Aviso Group, a business consulting and accounting firm focused on preparing clients for the future through innovation and positive growth. Welcome to Playing Above the Line. I'm Alan, your host, and we're recording today at Hatch in downtown Fairhope, and we always appreciate Rick Miller opening his space to us, and if you want to find out more about what those guys do here, you can go visit them at hatchfairhope.com. Our guest today is Melinda Bird Murphy, and we are uh, excited to have her. Melinda, welcome. Thank you, Alan. Glad to be here today. Now, Melinda, you are currently the Dean of External Funding at Coastal Alabama. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah, okay. And, and just looking over your resume, you, you have done a lot um, in the, in the <laughs> higher education field, for sure. So what made you decide that you wanted to be an educator? Because my wife is an educator. She's actually a middle school principal right now, which... I could never do that job, but she she loves it. And but seeing what she does and looking at her career through the years, it's a calling. I think a higher calling to education. I don't think that everybody's cut out for education, right? So, what about education drew you? To uh, that that's field? A, that's an excellent point, Alan. In fact, if you had asked me when I was growing up what I wanted to be a teacher, I would have said you must be crazy. Absolutely not. And then, in fact, when I was going to college, I, I didn't get a degree in education. But one of my first few jobs outside of college was working in public relations at a community college. And it was during that time that one of the division chairs of the college said, hey, I've got this developmental English class I need a teacher for. You think you mind doing that? Because I do have an undergraduate degree in English. I thought I would grow up reading books and doing that for a living. And I don't know what I thought I'd do with that, but it sounded great. So I said, sure, I'd love to teach the course. And Alan, when you said it's a calling, it absolutely is. I walked into that classroom for the first time. And while there were some bumps in the road, let me tell you, if you've never taught, there there are some bumps in the road when you walk in a classroom, but I loved it. I knew then I said, this is my path. This is the course I want to do. And so I started working toward getting the right credentials and the right degrees in order to teach. Absolutely. Your position now is Dean of External Funding, so I've got to think that that involves fundraising to some extent. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Primarily grant writing, searching for external funding outside of state funding for education. And uh, yeah, that's a long way from developmental English. But along the way, one of those things that happens is a career while in education, I always look for the next thing to do. So I went from teaching developmental education English to going back into the K-12 sector And I stayed in K-12 for seven years, and I loved every one of those years. Sort of did a future casting, though. Mm -hmm. Where did I want to go next? And so I wanted to go into the higher ed sphere. And it was during my time when I first started in higher ed that because I was an English major, everybody I worked for said, hey, you must be able to write. (laughs) And I said, well, I can. I, I can write. I can do what I can. I can certainly try. And they said, well, we've got this grant. Do you think you could write this for us? So grant writing is not necessarily the same type of writing you do in Mm -hmm. an English degree. Right. But the concept is the same, telling a story. What's the story you need to tell? Mm -hmm. So I started writing some small grants. Some of the jobs I had in my earlier career in education required grant funding. I worked with the uh, Alabama Writer Symposium for many years, and Mm -hmm. we had to submit for grant funding for that. And uh, so I kind of got into grant writing. And so the College Coastal, you know, saw a need to explore additional funding and the time of diminishing funding from state right. allocations. And I was presented this opportunity and said, yeah, I'd be glad to. So that's kind of where I am now. Gotcha. OK. And, and that's all very interesting. But I am curious for your take on our upcoming leaders. And so you've seen K through 12, obviously, children. You've seen college age students. I mean, what is your take on the overall shape of our new generation coming up that is going to be leading this country, you know, in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Interesting. Actually, I'm I'm very positive about the upcoming generations of leaders. One thing I see a lot in students, they are a lot more collaborative, creative, and they are going to be potentially open-minded to ways of learning, probably more so than my generation was. Yeah. And with the pandemic right now going on, I mean, they're having to get acquainted with distance learning. And I'm sure they're all becoming very proficient in, in Zoom meetings and, you know, Google Classroom and all those things. So they're they're really having to change their method of learning as, as well as educators changing their, their teaching methods. We have actually changed more in the structure of teaching, I would say, in the last 12 
12 weeks than probably <laughs> we are familiar with in the past 12 months. And I won't say 12 years We're we've been progressing quite a bit, but absolutely the last 12 weeks, K-12, higher ed, the sphere of education mm-hmm. in itself. Alan, you're absolutely right. It, it's changed a lot and I don't see us necessarily reverting back. I do see us improving on what we're doing so mm-hmm. that we have leadership opportunities for our students to to show themselves. We don't want them hiding away. We want them to be able to provide leadership and to learn leadership. One of the things I hear a lot from friends and colleagues, the level of stress these students are feeling is probably greater than, again, perhaps just a, a decade above them. And of course, we've all had our stresses as we've gone through the educational system. But they're learning so much at, what would we say, a drinking from the fire hose speed yeah, of right. it. Let me ask you this then and along that same vein. How have the teachers and the, and the leaders in the schools dealt with having to change their methods? It's not something that I don't think they would necessarily have chosen to change as quickly or as abruptly as they've had to do. So have you seen differences in, in how people have reacted to that and embraced it? I mean, do you have people who are still kind of pushing back and, and not really wanting to make that pivot like they've had to, or, or has everyone pretty much gotten on board and with the uh, current circumstance? Well, from the experience I have in just dealing with colleagues in the higher ed and having friends and colleagues in K-12, most of the teachers and administrators are embracing the change. They, and I'll say we, I won't say they, we really don't see a reverting back to what was before 2020. Mm -hmm. Do I think everything will always be online? No, I sure don't. But I do think this has helped us warp speed into technology and to more creative ways of teaching and learning. So we will continue to embrace that. And there's been a lot of silver linings in this. And a lot of the teachers, both in K-12 and higher ed, have absolutely embraced it and are some of the strongest online instructors I've seen. And the ones who aren't are getting a lot of assistance getting there. And, you know, those that haven't, who are fortunately like I am, if they need to retire, they're at an age where that is an option. (laughs) Right. But most people are embracing it because they see it as a necessity. And really the conversations I'm hearing is they are so desperately wanting to connect positively with students that they're trying everything they possibly can to make sure they're still teaching and their students are still learning. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, That's good stuff. Okay, so let's let's talk about leadership. This is why we're here. So when I say the word leader or leadership, I mean, what comes to mind? What is your definition of somebody that you consider to be a good leader? For me, leadership is about global visioning. I see leaders as people who have global vision for either an organization, a government, a school, if you will, the ability to see a large picture, and the ability to have people who work for them, if they're able to hire them, great. But if not, to encourage people who work for them to do certain tasks to make sure that the overall ship is sailing in the right direction. So Mm -hmm. when I think of leadership and I look at people I admire in leadership roles, they have a really good job of envisioning the big picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the episode primer that we sent, we asked you to list a couple of qualities of a good leader. And so the ones that you that you mentioned were empathy, the ability to listen to others and discern and decide. So, you know, empathy, I think we've talked about that and we've heard that other people mention that one. Listening, communication, I think is very important. had people talk about that before discern and decide though that's that's an interesting take on it so expand on that a little bit absolutely alan so for me to discern means you get hit with a lot of information on a daily basis you can absolutely have information paralysis as a leader it's important to discern what pieces of information are within your locus and once you know what that is to decide on it. So decision-making paralysis is another issue I've seen. And so as a leader, one of the hardest things to do is once you've discerned what is in the locus that you need to act on, decide on it, make a decision. One of the worst things we can do as leaders is not make a decision. Sometimes in itself, that is a decision, but Mm -hmm. it leads to non-clarity in an organization. And if the organization isn't clear, then that's where I think organizations run into struggles. Yeah, I totally agree. And we've heard the phrase analysis paralysis. I think that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can get so caught up in the weeds and not make a decision. So, but why do you think that is? I mean, why do you think that there are people out there and there are leaders out there that I'm sure that you know, and and I do too, that they're, they consider themselves good leaders and maybe they are just in some regard, but they can't make a decision or they won't make a decision. So, I mean, why do you think that is? Is that just 
what, human nature in some people, or are they afraid of the repercussions? I mean, what is it? I, I think you're all of the above, Alan. I think depending on the personality, people, some leaders are paralyzed at making a decision because of the repercussions. However, I think as a leader, once you have discerned the information and you've made a decision, the decision is what it is. Once it's made, you can absolutely bet your money somebody's not going to be happy. Right. But making a decision is not about making people happy. Making decisions is about what is right for the organization. Again, mm-hmm. whatever organization that is. You know, you have a mission. Right. You have a vision. The decision needs to support that mission and vision. And as long as the decision supports that, while there will be some that are unhappy with it, the decision is made. Can you make a different decision down the road? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And we've seen that happen just within the pandemic. Right. Again, going back to the issues we're having in education. Yeah. We can make a decision today. And in two weeks, we can make another one. Right. As needed. Yeah. And, you know, I think sometimes people see that as maybe a sign of weakness, but it's okay to say that I made the wrong decision, even to say that I was wrong, period. As long as you were making your, your initial decision out of, like you said, the information that you thought was pertinent at the time and, and important, you know, there's, it's okay to say, oops, I messed up. Let's change and try something else. Well, Alan, I think you just hit the nail on the head. If, if I could have written a leadership vision statement, thank you for that. It is the ability to admit you're wrong. Mm-hmm. I think leadership is the ability to admit you're wrong because it is important to make a decision on the information you have at the time. Absolutely. The information can change. The direction can change. And as a leader, you need to go with that and make sure you're doing what's right. So it's okay to make a different decision down the road. I think people are afraid of that. I agree with you. I think those of us who come from a certain generation were told it was weak. It, mm-hmm. You know, once you made a decision, yeah. you never back down right. from it. But I think that you need a growth mindset. Yeah, no, I, I agree totally. Well, let me ask you about your own leadership journey. So have you always, and you've done a lot, I mean, you know, in, in both higher ed and K through 12. So have you always considered yourself a leader or do you, is there a specific point in time where you've, it finally dawned on me, hey, I'm a leader. What was that journey like for you? I think for me, my role as a leader has happenstance because apparently I just won't give up. <laughs> I don't think people look at me and anoint me as a leader. I think that I have a strong ability to stay a course and to be determined. I've often said that I'm not competitive, but I'm highly determined. Okay. I will finish what I start. And I've always said to do your job is sometimes the hardest job. So I've always found that whatever job I've been tasked with, and I've had many, I've had such great experiences too. And I think that's another thing that has helped. I've had varied experience in my career. So in every way along the road, I've learned something new from someone new. And I think having those experiences wrapped up into one has helped me develop sort of a wider array of skills and talents and abilities. So that sort of helped me when a position has become available, have some of the skills necessary to step into those roles. Yeah, no doubt. Well, let's talk about the late Congressman John Lewis. Uh, he recently passed away, but he is someone that you indicated you admire. So what is it about Congressman Lewis that resonated with you? Why do you like him so much? I, I first of all think if you want to talk about someone who has been through such hardship, but who has handled, and I'll, I'll, I'm still talking about him in the present, it's just still so um, fresh to me, mm-hmm. who handled himself with such grace and mercy in the light of hardship and struggle, that it is hard for me personally not to admire that because mm-hmm. it is so easy to deal with hardship and struggles and become hard hearted and to become distanced from others. Whereas the late Representative Lewis embraced that. And we can tell from his trajectory, his own leadership skills and his ability to touch everybody he met, regardless of their political affiliation. It's just admirable. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is such a skill. It's amazing that you can go through what he went through, especially the the civil rights struggles back in the 50s and 60s and having everything. God only knows what done to him, but he wasn't bitter or angry. He was just trying to make the world a better place. I think that's absolutely amazing. And that, you know, to me, he also represents something that Marcus Aurelius said years ago, and that is you take victory and defeat with the same sword. 
and how you handle it is what helps develop your character and who you become as a leader. And again, I say character. I think leader is what people put place on you Mm -hmm. based on what they see in you. And I think that what Marcus Aurelius was alluding to is that, again, taking And I won't go into ancient Roman history for those of you who don't like it, (laughs) but there are obviously instances where that happened. Cato comes to mind. The representative John Lewis also represented that. Mm -hmm. He had great despair and great heights, but he was the same person. He handled it with such ethical integrity and character. And I think that if we can remember those examples, then... You can be a leader in whatever your area is. I did a leadership class for new faculty and staff a couple of years ago, and they ranged from everyone from instructors to admissions associates to whatever field. In every session we met, we talked about it doesn't matter your job title. Mm -hmm. Are you a leader in your field? Do you take ownership? Do you feel ownership? If not, why? What could we do to develop that in you so that you feel very confident and competent? And what you're doing. And then people will look to you to do things. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm a firm believer that that there are leaders at every level of every organization, even the ones that don't have the title. Leader, I mean, there are people that people just fall in behind and they absolutely lead every day, even though they might not be, quote, the boss or the leader Mm -hmm. or the department head or or whatever. So that's a great point. I do want to ask you about this because it's the title of the presentation caught my eye. So you did a presentation back in 2019 called Talent Hub, 75,000 Degrees to Success. What was that about? Because it sounds interesting to me. It is actually very interesting. And it took me a while to wrap my brain around the concept of what is a talent hub. So let me give you a quick history on that as well. Coastal Alabama Community College, the University of South Alabama, Bishop State Community College, and the Mobile Area Educational Foundation are partners in creating an educational and workforce pipeline for our region. 75,000 degrees or credentials are needed to fill what will become a vacuum of workers in our region. Mm -hmm. So that is the title of the presentation, the 75,000 Degrees Talent Hub. We are sort of tasked as a partner in making sure that we present talent into the next generation. And we're called, again, talent someone who gets a credential or a degree. And I think that's one of the great responsibilities of leaders today is coaching up and developing that next generation to come up, right, and to make sure that they have the skills and the abilities they'll need to not only fill jobs, but to but to lead. Now, you also did a presentation back in 2014. Now, if we're going to get into those presentations, there's well, not enough time today, no, Alan. But, but now, look, I've, I've got to ask about this because this is one of my favorite books. Are you I saying to... I've had too much time on my hand? Well, I'm just, I mean, you've done a lot, so that's all I'm saying. But uh, And I'm, I'm trying to pick and choose because we could, we could talk about all these, and I think we'd be here until next Tuesday. But I do want to just mention this one more. Teaching to Kill a Mockingbird in the, in the Classroom. I love that book. I think it, it's timeless. It's a classic, obviously. But what makes it resonate so much today as much as it did back when it was published back in the, I guess, 60s or whenever it came out. So I'm I'm a native of Monroeville, so I have a passion, obviously, for To Kill a Mockingbird. And I have been involved at the state and national level with several academics and scholars on To Kill a Mockingbird and teaching it. I had decided that I needed to go back and read it myself again for the umpteenth time. And then I did a presentation with some colleagues on how do you teach it in a classroom To Kill a Mockingbird is the quintessential social justice novel in a time when it wasn't even designed to be that novel. Mm -hmm. Don't believe that Neil Harper Lee was setting out to write a social justice book for the sake of it being that. I think she just innately recognized a story Mm -hmm. that needed to be told, Mm -hmm. and she did. And it's classic, it's timeless, because all I need you to do is turn on the news, social media, and take this novel and apply it through the lens and see how it just says, treat others as you yourself should be treated. It's such a basic principle. We are all human. We all deserve to be treated equitably and The novel itself, too. I mean, I know we focus when we read To Kill a Mockingbird or we hear that phrase. We think a lot about the classic courtroom scene. There's no doubt about it. But the novel itself, if you do take some time to go back and reread it, it's witty. It's funny. It does capture a moment in time. It's like reading a little bit of a time capsule. But it's also a lot like watching the Andy Griffith show as well. It doesn't matter if it's in Technicolor or black and white. Mm -hmm. The 
the principles in that show and the principles shared in her novel are timeless principles. No doubt it resonates as much today as it did 30 or 40 years ago. There's no doubt about that. My dad's from Monroe as well, and he was born in 1945. And so he tells the story of when, of course, they were, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. So they didn't have a car for the kids to take to town and that kind of thing. But when they needed to go to the square in downtown Monroe, they would have to walk by the Radley house. And they always crossed the street and walked on the other side of the street past the Radley house because they didn't want Boo to come out and, and get them, right? So anyway, and they definitely didn't walk that way at nighttime. So anyway, he always tells that story, which I think is very cool. So, all right, as, as we start to wrap up, obviously, John Lewis, somebody that you really admire. Has there been another mentor in your life, a personal mentor that you can, can point to that's had an impact on you? Yeah, absolutely. I've had more than one. And I did want to speak just a little bit in leadership in general about mentors and having a mentor mm-hmm. and being a mentor. I don't think, and I mentioned this earlier, Alan, I don't think leaders necessarily just happen. I think that mentors help hone your skill a little bit. They provide a sounding board for you and they provide the opportunity to show you some areas of growth, some areas of improvement and the ability to accept that conversation as well is important in in having someone mentor you is to have someone share with you some insights, some things they've learned and to take that and really think about it. And then also being able to pass that along to others. Again, when we hire new people, It is so important that people, whether they officially mentor them or they unofficially mentor them, help them understand the culture of the organization they're working in. And every organization has its own culture. But to be successful, you need a mentor, I think. Again, this is a personal reflection. But yes, I have definitely had more than one. I have been very fortunate to have had some great mentors. Yeah, I agree. And and I think that that's something that sometimes is maybe overlooked or as much importance is not placed on it as it should be. We had Deanne Servos from Prodigy Pantry on a couple of weeks ago, or maybe even last week, I can't remember now. And she pointed out that as she was starting Prodigy Pantry, she did not have anybody to mentor her. And so as a result, that's made it all that more important for her to be that mentor to other people. So uh, yeah, that's that's good stuff. I could sit here and talk to you all day because you're very interesting and, and have done a lot, but we have to wrap up, unfortunately. But I do want to ask this question. So because of your English background and your passion for, for that, if you had the chance to sit down and talk to one literary character in history, and it could be someone that's real or or fictional, or an author, who would you choose? Who would you want to sit down and have a conversation with? If I were to choose an author to talk to, I think that one of my favorite authors is Barbara Kingsolver. The Poisonwood Bible was probably one of those influential books I read as a young adult, where she really talks about the adversity of living on the continent of Africa in the mission field and uh, just learning so much from that novel about adversity and how to handle it. And she writes it with such beauty and phrasing that, yeah, I would love to just sit down and talk with her. But I have a lot of authors that I absolutely adore. And I've, I've had the privilege of, you know, of talking to Winston Groom and discussing his works And um, I've had the privilege of just recently talking with Patty Callahan Henry, who's the Harper Lee Award winner for uh, 2019 for literature. And uh, I do like talking with them. And I'm fascinated more about the technique of writing, Mm -hmm. I think, as well. The absolute discipline that it comes to writing. So I just have a lot of authors that I love to read. I have a varied reading taste, sometimes not any worth mentioning. (laughs) But... um, Yeah, so I guess that's, I love to read and I love to talk to authors if I can, and I love varying styles of it. Yeah, I agree. And I'll tell you what, I'm I'm amazed as well, because I don't have that talent, I don't consider myself to be very creative as far as the talent that it would take to write music or prose or anything like that. But my daughter is obsessed with Hamilton, so we've seen it in person, but we watched it several times since it came out on Disney+. And I am amazed at the fact that Lin-Manuel Miranda wrote the lyrics, the music to that I mean, there are a lot of words in that in that musical, if you haven't seen it. I mean, it is absolutely unbelievable. Um, there are a lot of words. I a agree. A lot of words. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I, I continue to be fascinated and amazed by people who have that talent. So I agree with you. Those are fascinating, fascinating people. Melinda, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. You've given some great insights, and uh, we appreciate that. No, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. And if you want to learn more about Melinda and what she does, you can visit her LinkedIn profile at Melinda Bird Murphy. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if you did, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes and Spotify. It definitely helps us in the ratings, and it also makes it easier for other folks to find the podcast. And as always, a big thank you to producer and editor, Carrie Wolf. 
Playing Above the Line is sponsored by Aviso Group. If you want to know more about who we are and what we do, you can visit our website at avisogroup.com. That's A-V-I-Z-O group.com. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks for listening.